Good morning, everyone. How's your Bible reading? I hope that you get a copy of our bulletin and there's a, a devotional plan for the whole week. And we know that we are in a series called Going Back to the Basics. And uh, two Sundays ago, Elder Rex told us about the credibility and the claims of the Word of the Bible as the Word of God. Now, talking about claims, I remember the story of uh, three loonies or lunatics uh, talking in the courtyard of a mental asylum. So the first lunatic said to the second one, do you know who I am? And the second one said, sorry, sir, I don't know you. But the first one said, you know, I am the true Dr. Jose Risa. And the second one said, uh, excuse me, sir, but you're wrong. I am actually Dr. Jose Risa. And the, third, uh, the first one said, indictedly, who said so? And the second one said, God whispered it in my ear. I am Dr. Jose Risa. And the third lunatic looked at them and said, Why? I didn't whisper anything to you. <laughs> well, you know, how can you believe those claims, especially when loonies you talk, right? Now, we are in a series again called Going Back to the Basics, and we will talk about Jesus Christ. You know, in 1972, Frank Adams wrote a book entitled Scientific Search for the Face of Jesus, the Many Faces of Jesus. Now, does it ring a bell, uh, the, the title, The Many Faces of Jesus? Well, if you're a fan of Elvis Presley, you know, it so happened that this book was being read by Elvis Presley when he died in his bathroom in Graceland, Memphis, Tennessee. And the title stands as a fitting symbol for the confusion surrounding Jesus in our time. It's been 2,000 years and more than 2,000 years and men still debate about Christ. But nothing is new. So today we're going to go on a quest for answers that will be, and we'll be focusing on the two most important questions that will ever be asked of ourselves. Who do you think or what do people say about Jesus Christ and who is Jesus Christ to you? So brothers and sisters in Christ, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? They gave him four different answers. You see, when Jesus walked on planet earth, people were still confused as to his true identity. Some say he was John the Baptist, a prophet, Jeremiah, perhaps a political leader. One man with many faces. One question with many answers. So we're going to class today and there will be a lot of uh, data and information. So once in a while, I'll ask you if you're with me. So please, I want you to say yes. And even if you're not with me, please answer yes. At least I'll know that you are still awake. Are you with me? Yes. Oh, good. Everybody's still awake. All right. So open your Bibles to Matthew 16, verses 13 to 16. But before we go on, let's commit this time to the Lord. Lord, thank you again for the presence of everyone. Thank you so much for how, Lord, you have cared for us the past days. And here we are, Lord, with excited hearts, Lord, praise, full of, full of praises and thanksgiving, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we come to your word, I pray, oh God, that you'll just uh, challenge us, Lord, open the eyes of our hearts. Help us to see you more, oh God. Lord, thank you. Fill this place with your presence and fill us this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the beginning, the beginning of our text Jesus takes his disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi. It is also at this time that religious leaders are plotting his death. And the disciples are probably tired and weary from the controversies and tension. So Jesus gets alone with them in a retreat setting in order for them to, be, to refocus, to regroup, and to recharge. This afforded them an opportunity to be with Jesus, you know, alone with Jesus, 
And also, the problem in that retreat center, it was also a link of religious uh, symbolism. But Jesus purposely brought them there. And what happened in this retreat center would alter the course of human history. Now, Caesarea Philippi was a pagan territory, and, but also a beautiful, picturesque city. 1,500 feet above sea level, just like a Tagaytay city. Now, on the side of the mountain was a cave where a temple was built to Caesar and the pagan god Pan. Now, historians tell us that on the side of the mountain, at the cave, the entrance of the cave, it was where Baal entered Hades. Now, the entrance to the cave is now known the gates of Hades. We'll see that phrase two verses after our text. Are you with me? Yes. Parang nakalahati na agad. Natutulog na. Okay. The disciples were surrounded by a plurality of religions and uh, pagan worship that God uh, condemned. Alright? But they were undoubtedly so happy to be with Jesus. And I picture them settling in that retreat center when Jesus asked the first question, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, I would like to believe that it was just a pop quiz. They were not expecting an examination from Jesus. So it was easy for them to answer that because the misguided multitudes uh, were talking about Jesus and everyone had a concept of who Jesus was. We don't really know who answered the question but there were four answers that bubbled into the surface. First, John the Baptist. As I said earlier, John had been uh, held in high honor by the people. So they thought that he was uh, John the Baptist come back to life. And then we have our, our in Matthew 14, 1, 2, Herod. That was the belief of Herod. You see, at the time Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. So the second answer was Elijah. Hundreds of years, hundreds of years earlier, the prophet exposed what's inside the hearts of men. He performed miracles and inspired people. And the people thought that he was Elijah because Jesus was doing those things. And then third, or in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, you will read the prophecy. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And then third, we have Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah was known to speak boldly and yet mourn over the hardness of the people's heart. And the people saw this also in Jesus when he spoke of woes and weep also to the heart for the hearts of the people. And that people thought that he was Jeremiah. And lastly, one of the prophets. Those who could not decide who he was, they just said that he was just another prophet who had come back to life. Are you with me? Yes. Now, these are not bad answers in themselves, but they fell short as to who Christ was. Nobody confessed the real Christ, or nobody confessed he was the Messiah. Now, here's the point. Whenever you ask a group of people who Christ is, you will receive different answers. And they can't all be right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the disciples knew. The disciples knew what the people were saying and they were able to summarize their beliefs. Likewise, it is important for you and me to listen to what others say about Christ so that we will know what they're thinking. So that we will know how we can help them see the truth. You can, you know, you can speak of Jesus today as a prophet, as a holy man, as a rabbi, as a teacher, as a spiritual leader, and only few will object. But if you speak of Jesus as the Son of God, divine and the same nature with the father a lot of people will line up to express their disapproval a billion 
Muslims will say, Prophet, yes. But God, no. You scattered around the world would say, Teacher, yes. But God, no. Liberal Protestants and religion, religionists of every stripe will say, Exemplary man, yes. But divine, no. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Why do you believe in Him? And so as we begin our search for the answers, let's start by surveying the modern versions of Jesus. First, the good and powerful man. We start with this view because this is the most common face of Jesus. Of all the modern versions, versions of Jesus Christ, this is both closest to the truth and the deadliest error. I'm sure you're familiar with the book of Dan Brown called Da Vinci Code. One of the implications of that book was that Jesus was just a man. Are you with me? Uh, what, fort na lang? Natutulog na ang three forts. Okay. Here are some actual quotes from pages 232 to 235 in the book. Allow me to read these to you. Page 232. Nothing in Christianity is original. Referring to the Council of Nicaea, the character Tibin states, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet. A great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. So the disciples were, as according to Dan Brown, they knew Jesus was just a man. Okay? Then by officially endorsing Jesus as the Son of God, Constantine turned Jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchallengeable. In page 233, you see, 400 years after the death of Jesus, Constantine upgraded Jesus and said that he was a deity. 400 years after his death. Then what I mean to be countered is that almost everything our fathers taught us about Christ is false. Now these views of Jesus contribute to a wide spectrum about him. <coughs> and according to one pastor, Dr. Brian Beale, this book has capitalized on two intersecting cultural trends. One, enormous spiritual condition. Okay? Once, now listen to this, once someone doubts authority, he will soon be open to believe anything. Let me repeat that. Once someone doubts authority, he is open to believe anything. If you don't stand up for something, you will always fall for anything. Second, deep spiritual hunger. I made a reference of this last week in my sermon when I said that God has put eternity in every heart, in every human heart. There is that God consciousness in us that we look for Him. That there is this ability for all of us to know Christ personally. You see, it is as if you have reached a cliff. There's a big case and in between that and there's another cliff there. You want to go there because God, the one who created you, you would like to go there. But you would like to build, 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 bridge, build bridges. But they can only meet only half. You can reach the other side. That's why you can use sex, you can use power, authority, all of these things. But they will not reach the other side. God has put eternity, the God consciousness, the God hunger in all of us. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus was a good man. According to uh, Acts 10, 38, he went around doing good, performing miracles. But to stop there, you miss the central truth, the central reality of his divine personality. He is good because he is the Son of God who came to become the Savior of the world. The second modern 
version of Jesus is the revolutionary Jesus. This view was very popular in the 60s when left-wing radicals appropriated Jesus as the Messiah who came to overthrow the unjust powers and structures of his day and to bring in the kingdom through protests and violent actions. Now, some theologians even use the image of the revolutionary Jesus to support the establishment of Marxist governments all over the world. Now, Marxist government, I discussed that last Sunday. It's about communism. But thankfully, we don't hear this view nowadays. When or ever since the fall of Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism, this view, the revolutionary Jesus, has become a relic of modern history. But you know, as many people have said it, Jesus indeed is a revolutionary. But not in the sense intended by those who use the term. Jesus revolutionized love on this planet Earth. He wasn't concerned about overthrowing government. He was concerned about the sin in every heart. Two faces. Good man, revolutionary Jesus, and the most common, ecumenical Christ. This is the option of people who like Jesus, but they don't want to worship Him exclusively. So Jesus is lumped together with other notable religious leaders such as Buddha, Confucius, Gandhi, Muhammad, Moses, even Rizal. When they look up, they would see four or five faces peering down from heaven. And one of those faces is Jesus. And so they would just choose, oh, okay, we'll worship Him today. Many people believe the ecumenical Christ. Because it is the most convenient way of saying that you're a Christian, but you're still open-minded to other options. Good man. The revolutionary Jesus. The ecumenical Christ. After surveying these various answers, we are still left with the question, who do you say the Son of Man is? Who is Christ to you? If the answers of modern day men are wrong, what is the right answer? How will we know that it is right? Are you with me? Yes. yes. Uh, can you look at the person beside you? Because he's like a goat, you know, head butting. Well, in verse 15 of our text, we can read there, that there are really two parts in the question. But what about you? Who do you say the Son of Man is? Brothers, literally, this could be read. But you, who do you say that I am? Now, the passage didn't tell us, but I, like, I would like to believe that it was met with, the question was met with initial silence from the disciples because they were used to thinking about Jesus like that you know, he was their companion he was their friend he was their teacher but I'm sure at that point they, were, they haven't formed a firm opinion of who he was and so as Peter spoke up you know when one reason that Peter, that Peter spoke up was because the disciples were afraid to give the wrong answer. Peter took a risk with his response, you know. If he gave the wrong answer, he would be stoned to death by the other disciples. Why? Why do you think so? Because calling a man, an ordinary man, God, would be blasphemy. And he would be stoned to death by the disciples. But that didn't happen. Therefore, they shared the same conviction. With Peter's empathic response, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, Jesus is not a mythological figment, a, 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 a pagan god like Pan, or a mortal deity like Caesar. It could be read this way, You, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
His answer is very specific. Even in the Greek, the definite article the was used four times. You are the Christ, the Son of the God, the Living One. The name Christ, brothers and sisters, is the title, official title of Jesus used more than 520 times in the New Testament. Are you with me? Yes. 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 It means, brothers and sisters in Christ, that He was the anointed Messiah and Savior. You know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there were three kinds of people who were anointed. The priest, the prophets, and the kings. And in Jesus Christ, we see all those three. Peter had the courage to answer, to confess Christ in a pagan setting. And he was willing, brothers and sisters in Christ, to give a view that was contrary to the prevailing climate of that culture. His answer became the bedrock for the foundation of the unstoppable community called the church. And in verse 18, even the gates of Hades will not overcome. We participate in Peter's profession of faith when we will stand up and say, Jesus, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. Now let's go back to what Dan Brown said. Is it true that almost everything of, uh, that, that our fathers thought about Christ is false? Let's take a look at this spurious claim by looking at what Scripture teaches us. Now this is just a sampling. I would like, you, I would like to encourage you to keep on reading the Gospels. The first four books. No, actually, well, after I studied this, all the 27 books of the New Testament could be dated first century. Okay? First, are you with me? First century. And each references, each book references to the deity of Christ in some manner. It's absurd to think that the, the deity of Christ wasn't established until Constantine upgraded Jesus' status 400 years after his death. Are you with me? Constantine, or Dan Brown was saying that it was only Constantine who made Christ God. That was 400 years after his death. But if you read the New Testament, all 27 books, they were all dated 1st century, and they were already claiming that Jesus is the Son of God. Are you still with me? I love to see all smiles and you're awake. Well, I'm going to show you a number of passages. Without comments, we'll ask or we'll let the scripture speak for itself. Again, this is just a sampling. I encourage you to read more of the Gospels. If you've been reading the Gospel of John, the letters of uh, John, the book of Revelation, you'll compile an enormous amount of data about who Christ is. Now, in John 1, 1, 3, I listed this down last week, okay? From, from chapter 1 to chapter 10 only. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Who is that Word? Jesus. In John 1, 14, and Rabbi, you are the Son of God. John 5, 27, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. In John 6, 69, we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. John 7, 31, when, Christ, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? John 8, 24, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. John 8, 58, before Abraham was born, I am. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Now let me give you three more facts. And then we'll make that final decision, who is Christ to you? Now for us to get an accurate picture of the life of Jesus, really, we have to go to the four Gospels. But here's fact number one. 
fulfilled prophecy. The Bible uses a fascinating term to describe the moment of Jesus' birth. And that phrase is the fullness of time that we see in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It refers to that one chosen moment of history where God has arranged, ordained, orchestrated all circumstances so that His Son, perfectly, so that His Son would be born in just the right way, at the right moment, at the precise, exact location. It also refers to all the circumstances of Jesus' life, including His death and resurrection. Brothers and sisters of Christ, all of it was perfectly planned by God and predicted in writing before it happened. Are you still with me? Consider the following. These were prophecies about Jesus Christ. One, that he, that he would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. That he would be born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 4. That he would be born into the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10. That his ministry would begin in Galilee, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. That he would work miracles, Isaiah 61, verse 1. That he would teach in, in, in parables, Psalm 78, 2. That he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 9, 9. That he would be betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41, 9. That he would be sold for 30, 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12. That he would be accused by false witnesses, Psalm 35, 11. That he would be wounded and bruised, Isaiah 53, 5. That his hands and feet would be pierced, Psalm 22, 16. That he would be crucified with thieves, Isaiah 53, 12. That his garments would be torn apart and lots cast for them. Psalm 22, 18. That his bones would not be broken. Psalm 34, 20. That his side would be pierced. Zechariah 12, 10. That he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, 9. That he would rise from the dead. Psalm 16, 10. What's your observation? All the verses that I quoted were from the... Old Testament. You see, these are just a sampling or, uh, of a few of the hundreds of prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament. You see, the list is striking in the amount of detail surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. That even a casual reader would admit that it would either be an amazing coincidence or it was the result of divine planning. Are you with me? Yes. Number two, the empty tomb. This is, of course, the ultimate proof. Has Jesus really risen from the dead? If he did, then he is the Son of God. If he didn't, then he is not the Son of God. If he didn't, brothers and sisters in Christ, he is not even good, worthy to be called a good man because he was the greatest con man in the world. And we are fools to follow him. Therefore, I invite you, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, you read the Gospels with an unprejudiced mind and then get your own conclusions. When you do, I believe that you will come across these four following statements that are absolutely true. One, Jesus was really dead. Two, Jesus was buried in a tomb on Friday evening. Three, the tomb was empty on Sunday morning. And four, Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection alive from the dead. The Christian entire faith, entire faith hangs on this one fact. Jesus rose from the dead bodily, literally, visibly, physically. It was the testimony of the empty tomb that separates Jesus from other religious leaders. They are all dead. But Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Number three, transform lives. When Jesus left earth, there were only a few hundreds of disciples in Israel. That's all that he could show to us in his 33 years of existence. But today, 
There are over a billion people who bear His name. That little, tiny band of brothers, the tiny band of followers spread to every nation on every continent. To put matters in their proper perspective, more people have come to Christ in this generation than in the previous 2,000 years. History shows us that Jesus continues to change lives 20 centuries after he had walked the dusty roads of Galilee. Yet today, he is still the most influential person in history. John Lennon is dead. Karl Marx is dead. Napoleon Bonaparte is dead. Gandhi is dead. Marcos is dead. But Jesus Christ is alive. May we hear it. Si Bongbong buhay para. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the end, a decision about Jesus Christ has to be made. And it must become very personal. Who do you think Jesus is? Why do you believe in Him? Is He the Son of God? Is He the Messiah from heaven? Is He the revolutionary Jesus? Is He the misunderstood Palestinian rabbi? Is He who He claimed to be? Or is He something else altogether? When Jesus asked Peter, Who do you say the Son of Man is? In the midst of false views and confused, in that cultural confusion, Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may I submit to you at the end, after all these alternatives and these views that we have talked about, we are only left with three options. Three options. First, he might be a liar. Perhaps Jesus wasn't telling the truth and therefore he would fall into that category of uh, religious impostors selling fake snake oil to, to heal your bakokan. But note this, if Jesus is a liar, then he is the biggest and most successful liar in history. Right? Because until today, over a billion people have followed his lies. Talking about lies, I, I remember this uh, teacher, he asked his uh, class, what do they do? on weekends and there was this boy he was really a big liar he said you know, you know mom I played basketball yesterday and I scored 30 points in one quarter he was just 8 years old or 10 so another week came well what did you do the boy again said well we played baseball and I hit 5 home runs in just one inning what a liar <laughs> and then the next weekend, the teacher asked him again, or the class again, and then he answered, well, I crossed the Malinta Channel. I swam you know, for an hour. So the teacher said, I think I have to go to the principal and we tell him about these lies. And so he told the principal, you know, this boy, he's really a big liar. Introduce him to me and I'll show him how, what a big liar he is. And so that day came and uh, the teacher introduced him to the principal, the principal immediately said, you know, I was walking in the woods and then a big lion came and he chased me. After a while, a small puppy came out of the bush and, 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 and beat the lion, killed the lion and eat the lion. And the, the principal said, do you believe that? The boy said, of course. That was my puppy. It was the third lion that he ate for the week. <laughs> Big liar, liar. Well, one of our options about who Christ is, he was a liar. He might be a liar. Second, he might be a lunatic. A lunatic. Is it possible that he was well-meaning but deluded? Could it be possible that he was just, he knew that he was telling the truth, but the truth of the matter is that he should be in an asylum, a mental asylum. But the question remains, how could so many evidently normal people would follow a madman for 20 centuries? How could he trick us 
to believe in Him if He was a madman. If those two alternatives didn't suit you, you have no option left but this third. He might be the Lord. A man who said the things that Jesus said might be a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord from heaven. But if He is the Lord from heaven, then you dare not remain neutral. You have to give some account for how you will respond. If He is the Lord from heaven, then you have to yield your life to Him. No other response will suffice. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come to the end of this message, I want to ask you, do you really believe this morning that Jesus was telling the truth that He is really the Son of God? Who is Christ to you? Who do you think He is? Yes, it is important to know what others say about Christ. But you will be held accountable for that. You will be only be held accountable for what you think and what you do about it. How you respond to that question, brothers and sisters in Christ, will affect your life and your afterlife. So it has to be deeply personal. It comes to that point that you need to have a personal relationship with Christ. You know, there is an exam coming. And the good thing is that the question was already asked ahead. Who do you say I am? Listen to this. To be almost right with Jesus is to be totally wrong. I repeat that. To be almost right with Jesus is to be totally wrong. If your doctrine about Christ is wrong, all your doctrines are wrong. Who do you say I am? Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 10 give us the answer. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, a day is coming when we will bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That doesn't just include all Christians. It includes everyone, everywhere. Every knee will bow and every mouth will confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you have only two options. You can confess Him now as your Lord and Savior with joy. Or you can confess Him as Lord someday in shame and terror. What's your choice? What's your choice? Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are burdened and weary, for I will give you rest. Jesus Christ is your Savior. He loves you. He invites you to come to Him. He gave Himself for you today. His salvation tomorrow is judgment. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that we worship today, the Jesus Christ of true Christian faith. I would like for us to close our eyes. Perhaps you aren't sure. Just like those misguided multitudes, they don't know who Christ is. You know, God has moved you to be here this morning. So that you could hear this gospel. Of who Christ is. There is something in you. God consciousness they call it. You are looking after God. And trying a lot of things. But there is only one way. Only one way. That you could be back to a relationship with God. And that is through Jesus Christ. If there is anyone here 
who would like to call Jesus as his Lord and Savior, I would pray a, a little prayer. This prayer won't save you, but this prayer will help you to trust him even more. And I would like you, brother or sister, whoever you are, if you have the prompting of the Spirit, I won't ask you to stand. I won't ask you to raise your hand. Because God sees your heart and your mind. Just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Say that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. You have brought me to this place. You have brought me to this place. I've been running away from you. I'm a sinner. I've been running away from you. I'm a sinner. And I admit and I confess and I need repentance right now. I admit, I confess my sins all and I repent of them. I believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Say that I believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. He died for me so that I could be set free. He died for me so that I could be set free. God, I accept Jesus. Say that God, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Right now. Lord, thank you for your word. You just ask, Lord, for those people who pray. Pray, oh God, that they would just approach anybody from our congregation that they would like to know you more. I pray also for everyone, oh God, that it would be clear to us that indeed that we could profess what Peter said. We could stand up and say, Jesus is the Son of the living God. Jesus is the Christ. Thank you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.